Hello, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Mark Harrison. I'm the CEO of the DPP, and I'm delighted to have you with us for this DPP Next Gen Production Network event, which is being held in collaboration with our good friends at the AVID Community Association. Now, today we've got an absolutely captivating topic. We're going to be going right to the heart of what our industry is all about. We're going to be looking at what has happened around the shaping and editing of content. And let me perhaps just set the context for that conversation like this, that when we use the term non-linear editing, I think it's easy to imagine that that's quite a new thing, but actually it really isn't. I mean, non-linear editing is a kind of tautology. After all, you know, editing is precisely all about working with a finite number of audio visual assets and moving them about until you find the most effective way of telling a story. And that is precisely how film was edited for decades. But then we had this aberration with the invention of videotape. You know, in the 1960s, if you're going to put together a story on videotape, you had to edit it in a linear fashion, incrementally adding one shot to another. And if you wanted to make any fundamental changes, well then, heaven help you. So when the thing that got called non-linear editing came along with platforms like Avid and Lightworks in the early 1990s, what they were really doing was taking us back to the way that we could work before or that people still were when they were cutting on film. But with the extra benefit of digital technology, which meant that now we could do things in a more agile and flexible way, we could work with large amounts of content far more quickly. So although they didn't fundamentally change editing, what they did do was to allow a huge amount of experimentation on behalf of directors and editors. And I think most people would agree that with their arrival, we started to see a much greater diversity of content types and editing styles and much more innovation around the way that stories got told. Nonetheless, the workflows that emerged around these tools got set pretty quickly. And, you know, I'd say that for about three decades, they were pretty well understood. I think most people who worked in production or post-production could have drawn out a typical workflow. And then a couple of years ago, a couple of things happened. First of all, we got the cloud. You know, we got virtualized editing where the, the assets themselves were being held somewhere in a data center. And now a range of people in a range of places and at a range of times could all access that content at once. The second thing that happened was virtual production, where we found that we could create photo real uh, virtual images on a stage and capture them in camera so that the, the material that we would take to the cutting room could be more fully formed earlier in the process. Now, the question is, have developments like this fundamentally changed what it means to shape content? You know, have we shifted the balance in any way, even the balance of creativity in the way that our workflows have now changed? And ultimately, have we altered what it means now to be an editor? Well, as I said, these are pretty captivating questions and I am honored that I'm joined today by six truly fantastic people uh, to, discuss, to discuss this topic. Um, but of course, we want to hear from you as well. And you'll see that at the bottom of your screen there is um, there's a Q and A button. So please feel free to contribute your comments, your questions and thoughts as we go. I'll be keeping an eye on them and we will bring them into the conversation. Now, six great people, but that's a lot of people for you to meet all at once. So we're gonna do this uh, three by three. Um, and the first three that I'd like you to meet are these. They are Dane Smith, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at The Third Floor. We have got Lisa Gray, who's an Executive Producer with Build Studios. 
And also we've got Gemma Nicholson, who is the founder of Post Super. Now, Dane, in fact, is not sitting on a virtual production set. <laughs> he's actually got an emergency with the production, so he's currently in his car, but uh, we can see him pretty well. And I think we're better to hear him pretty well. Um, you may have guessed, if you know these three people or you know their companies, that actually we're going to start this conversation kind of at the end. We're going to start by looking at the impact of virtual production on the shaping of content. Um, and Dane, perhaps I can come to, to you first, because um, I think it'd be very helpful, particularly for anyone who hasn't yet worked on a virtual production, and heavens, most people still haven't. Um, could you just talk through for the uninitiated, you know, what, what the kind of key processes are in, in, in forming content, putting it in front of the camera and then taking it on into the cutting room? What happened? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be delighted. And thank you. Thank you for inviting me to uh, share on this topic. It's, it's very timely. And um, I think the chief uh, change that's happened is we're empowering creatives earlier in the pipeline than we had previously. So if you think about an LED volume, the room you're in, we're all LED screens, including the floor and ceiling. And I'm running a a powerful processor that can port imagery to those screens. We're now able to set focus behind the screen plane and with very careful onset lighting and art department support, it becomes virtually impossible to tell what's digital and what isn't. Uh, even at a very uh, high frame rate, even at a very high pixel count, it's virtually indistinguishable. And what that's done is shift a lot of the creative from post-production to pre-production. What I mean by that is that I spent most of my career in finals VFX and you're sitting in um, an avid bay with the director and you're making decisions that are really based on diminishing return. Mm. You either have the footage or you don't, uh, you're fighting the clock and there wasn't that central reservoir of information shared with people on set. And of course they're long gone and uh, the image rarely matches what the director had in mind when he or she read the initial script. What we're doing is, is we're empowering the director at very little cost, at very little impact um, on the production to iterate early on. What I mean by that is we're handing the director a tablet, similar to an iPad, and we're porting assets, motion capture, lighting, virtual and practical set into that viewfinder. And the director can then make choices based on a very close approximation of the final image that's fed to editorial sooner and with the director's blessing. So we have circle takes and we can distribute that information to all of the keys, either future hires or people that are currently engaged. And one of the central hubs of information that makes sure everyone has the current version are the Perforce servers. So everyone is tapped into the computer's brain, has all of the latest data, even, even you know, as recent as moments ago. And uh, that empowerment of the director has, has completely changed the way we create content. And we first saw it on the Avatar film and, and some of the sequels, but when pandemic hit and we needed to use this distributed workforce and the cloud was uh, something that was available to us, virtually every production I was working on was exploring this method of filmmaking and now it's, it's very rare that anyone uh, uses that old linear uh, approach. Okay. But I, actually that's a good moment though for me to, to come to, to Lisa because Lisa, although you, know, you can instantly understand some of the excitement around this way of working, um, it does also mean that, uh, that I guess there's, there's an editing process, if you like, that's happening in those very early stages and the way that something is storyboarded and developed and then turned into imagery and worked on in, in a game engine. I mean, is it akin to editing in your mind? It's, uh, I, I think what I'm finding most fascinating having come from a linear career to, to now very solidly in virtual production is that there are different types of people involved at different stages now and having to have conversations with each other for the first time. <laughs> So there's um there are 
you know, visual effects uh, supervisors have gone from the people that are having, not all the time, and some are, are, are very involved, but, you know, they're often referred to, oh, we can fix that in post, right? That's fine. But these, these kind of talents and specialists are having to be involved in pre-production and even in earlier stages when it comes to realising the potential of a virtual production set. So it's... um. Look at the end of the day, um, it can make it. You can you, you can blow your mind, and you can get very overwhelmed by the different processes going on. But be grounded in the fact that it's storytelling, and it's just there are different creatives coming in at different stages to what they are used to, um, which is exciting from a creative perspective, but also very humbling, showing that we need to work out new ways to talk to each other, new ways to communicate, and new ways to. Um, to to yeah to realize what we what we need to realize um there's some producers i know who often are just involved in the pre-production production stage and uh someone else looks after it in post but we're having to bring a lot of the things that you think about in post up earlier which i think is person personally i find incredibly exciting but it's a big adjustment um in at mars the uh the place i work mm. we've had um We've had factual entertainment. Well, sorry, we've had a documentary in with Sir David Attenborough, and it's been. I come from a documentary background, so watching these kind of technicians, uh, crew members come in and not just be in a studio, but be in a virtual production studio is so like wouldn't wouldn't have been imagined or thought it was a skill set, but now it's definitely one that's considered. Um, we've had TV commercials, we've had scripted series. And even for the people that do work in studios a lot, especially when it comes to lighting, and especially when it comes to um, it comes to art department, and it comes to color, you know, these there's everyone's learning. But um, but I think that's exciting, and I think that just means I can't wait for a couple of years down the track. Moments we've all worked out how to communicate with each other. What kind of creativity will come out of that? Gemma, are you finding that uh, that editors are starting to be involved in some of these processes themselves. So even though they may not yet be in a position to work with rushes that they're being consulted yeah. in early visualizations. We have um, always had the idea of the previs editor. So or the pre-visualization editor the, um, for VFX. And I think that, um, you know, and also depends on the editor's relationship with the director and the editor's relationship with the, you know, the project in general, whether they are um, uh, an editor for hire or whether they are an integral core team, you know, you know kind of core team member. I think there's, there is a distinction there between people who, you know, especially when you're talking about TV series or you're talking about um, uh, films, there's a difference in the way that people view the editor and there's a difference mm. in the way in the um, the point at which they've come on board. You know, if you're talking about those really uh, massive films, um, then it really does help to have your editor on as soon as possible. Um, you know, post supervisors know that post-production doesn't begin in post, it, you know, post-production post begins in prep. It's not a, it's something that can be separated out. We, you know, we're making, as soon as you press record on the camera, you're into post-production. So we need to make sure that all of those decisions are made very early on. Now, I think that having the editor there, you know, to consult or to, to work with, um, uh, you know, previs uh, VFX or previs, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the volume, um, it's kind of one and the same. It is just, it is part of the, the whole editing process. However, I might kind of separate that out to being a VFX editor or a pre-visualization editor kind of for, the, for that early work and have your traditional editor come on from in, in the, traditional, uh, the traditional time, which is the start of your shoot. So, but that, that person may also do some consultancy work early on, but they wouldn't be brought on full time. They wouldn't be, they, they would just be another voice. Um, to add to the, the cacophony. I think sometimes too many cooks. Yeah I, yeah, I can imagine there could be that downside as well. Lisa. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Gemma. I think um I think that's the 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 challenge and opportunity I see on set um now where um the characters are all still the same, but they're they're being consulted at different times, um more so. Um and I think um you know 
when we talk like genre disciplines, like, you know, the, seeing the documentary crew compared to the scripted crew and when people are brought in, I think um, that was quite a new world for the documentary crew um, for what, you know, I guess personally my career I've experienced and, and, and documentary makers I know, but definitely for this, the, the scripted crew, that was the case. So, yeah, yeah. I had one uh, editor who uh, I was talking to him about um, this particular webinar and he says, he said, well, you wouldn't invite your editor on the location recce. And, um, and I absolutely agree with him. I think there is, there is a difference between kind of uh, that pre-visualization work and the, you know, pre-vis the effects work and the actual traditional editing storytelling that we that we need to do as well. So I probably split the editor role into those two component parts, the storytelling, which is absolutely the traditional, you know, editor. And we're telling stories, as you said earlier, Lisa, it's just, you know, we're just telling stories. We are, you know, we're still, uh, you know, doing that. But then there is a whole load of work that needs to be done right up front, which needs to kind of be managed as well. And, and that is maybe, more pushed into the visual effects and previous editor um, sphere. That's a really, really helpful way of thinking about it, Gemma. Um, you know, the, the notion that you wouldn't take an editor kind of onto location for a, a shoot. Um, but Dane, I, I just wonder whether the, the, the effect of being able to do so much with the image that you're going to <laughs> gather in a virtual environment um actually now means that, that what the editor gets to work with when it arrives in the cutting room is more is more preset that if you like you know that their their personal influence in the shaping of the story is, is slightly reduced would that be true um I haven't seen that, I think, often if a production's organized correctly. And every uh, production we're involved in is very bespoke. Everyone sort of has their own criteria and methodology and players. And we're, we're still a long ways away from people that have five years experience working in this uh, yeah. new method of content creation. So there's, there's sort of a mixed bag each time. But the other point I wanted to make that may answer your question is I was at the VES Awards the other night and I was just stunned at the quality of episodic uh, visual effects and then I look at our studio and most of the innovation most of the content that people get very excited about is episodic and what's happening in episodic is you have directors rolling on for one or two episodes you're doing pre your shoot and post simultaneously and once you get into four to six episodes you, you have a massive amount of uh, organizational uh, skill required to, to manage all of that. And I think in pre we're really just trying to feed the beast. We're trying to get the images um, as close to final and in front of the picture editor and either the showrunner or director so that they can make uh, the decisions on shaping the narrative. However, we also have a proximity that we've never previously had to the director on set we're with the director as they're finding shots and so the onus is on us to pass that information forward yeah that's really helpful i guess it plays to what you were saying lisa about sort of building new communities of of creatives that if you're making a number of episodic pieces you know in parallel um you just have to do that now if you're going to maintain quality yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's, it's super key. Yeah, yeah. So it's in, in some respects, I guess the, the, the picture editor's role sort of becomes more pure, you could say, than perhaps it, it would have been a few years ago. It's also very interesting. Sorry to jump in, Lisa. I don't want to cut you off. Um, it's also very interesting in the way that high-end TV shows and, and episodic is set up in terms of the editing or um, director editor teams that we, we have. If you're shooting in blocks or if you're shooting in single episodes, it really does depend. Uh, you may have on a 10 episode show, you may have 10 individual, well, you wouldn't, you probably have five 
editors or you might have three or you might have two or you mm -hmm. might just have one editor director team that walk through the entire entire show it's sorry entire series i apologize um so it really is and trying to get consistency between the way that um the episodes look and feel that's very much the showrunner's um role in making sure the whole arc is right so it kind of without you know it doesn't diminish the editor's role as the storyteller but it makes them part of a smaller cog in a much bigger machine as they kind of um Dan was saying um and I think it's it, it very much makes them more uh, kind of an editor for hire as opposed to being um you know uh, as opposed to well I'm saying editor for hire but you, uh, what I mean is um uh, there's somebody with a specialist function yeah yeah, yeah. I mean actually that that so that that addresses a question that has been asked by Kurt Mason from uh, less is more pictures who's asking whether um the editor's actually becoming more part of a directorial team and it sounds generally as if you're saying actually perhaps the reverse i think with high-end television and we call it high-end tv in the uk um you know it's much more described as episodic um tv in the states um uh, i think it is uh, a case of they are not part of that director. There's no news director. You know, some directors can't work without a specific editor in 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 film. You know, you have your Scorsese Thelma kind of uh, relationships. You've got your you know the the editor is integral to that directorial team. And absolutely, I think in film that's just part of. Uh, you know, I've worked with directors who can't function without their their, their editor. Um, so you know that that is a, kind of part of the fantastic creative worst that universe that is film however episodic tv has to be with smaller budgets you know we're talking about 30 million you know kind of however long your piece of string is for a, a film you're talking about kind of you know maximum i would have said you know kind of 3 to 10 million is a, is kind of 10 million is your maximum really for an episodic tv show per episode so it's very much smaller budget in terms of the you know the scope that we have to play with and I think that's where virtual production really comes into its own if you are building a volume for multi-episodes you know you get so much more value out of that volume than you would do if you were just using it on one episode and that was it right so Right. Absolutely. We've actually starved a couple of the bigger, the V stages in um, at, at Warner Brothers and, um, and, you know, they've, they've gone on for series that, you know, that, that, that have multiple episodes and you absolutely see the benefit for that. And, you know, we, one of the reasons why we set up our permanent volume at Mars was so it was more accessible for more people to try because of what Gem is talking about with the the setup and the and the pull down and even mm. with every every different client we've had we've only been open since August we have had to alter slightly we we start with a twenty five by uh, twenty five point five meter volume a lot long and then it's about five five meters tall at the moment yeah and then it's um which is which is you know we found through our research was a really good middle point to start but um. But yes, do definitely echo what Jim is saying. Oh, okay. Just before we bring the others in, there's one question here I want to address from uh, Eric Peters from Hingepoint, who's asking whether actually these workflows have a lot in common with animation workflows and whether we have a lot to learn from that. Dame, would you, would you say so? I would say it's very similar. And I also wanted to point out something, and I, I wonder where uh, Gemma and Lisa sit on this, but it seems to me that because of the budgets and the giant land grab that's going on in streaming right now when we do episodic we're commanding a team and a budget and resources that are equal to two tentpole features and it feels to me like a lot of the lexicon and workflow and best practices are starting to be dictated by episodic because there's just so much of it being created and it's so popular if you look at um there's a there's a streaming service called antenna that's starting to release ratings and the ratings on things like the mandalorian or any of the um, mcu content are just off the charts it's where the audience is right now it's where the budgets are and i wonder how much of that is sort of 
forming the best practices. I think I'm going to jump in first, Lisa, if that's all right. Uh, um, I think that it's a really interesting question, Dan, because I think that that actually the the two are informing each other. That, that we have so much cross pollination now between the people who are working on film and the people who are working on TV. If you looked at, you know, the ten years ago. People who worked on film did not work on TV and people who worked on TV did not work on film. But now we have much more of a meld between the two. And, and I think the audience is requiring the production values. I mean, the production values that, that um, people like Netflix and Amazon and um, uh, you know, all of those big, big companies, Apple, who are making incredible content, you know, uh, they are requiring very high production values you know from game of thrones onwards it's good it's been it's been a case of needing to um uh, grab market share and and gain audience by and keeping them by you know those high production values so i think you know one informs the other but you can't have high production values without decent budgets and so so obviously they you know we've gone from a, you know very small budgets for TV to increasingly larger and larger and larger budgets, which is, you know, in a quite an incredible shift. You know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have dreamt about spending $10 million or 10 million pounds on an episode, you know, of TV. But yep. now, you know, so there are lots of TV shows out there that have that. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, um, uh, some of the, as, as, as being a, a newer volume and I guess trying to make, you know, helping to help virtual production become more mainstream. Um, it's often, we find a lot of people are walking into our space as a, it's, it's a cost effective solution. So they've got like lots of car shots they need to do and let's just do backplate on it because the reflections are so much better than green screen. And, and, um, and because it is not a cheap solution. But I think as going back to what Gemma was saying in terms of the longer episodic work, um, you know, in terms of the, the innovation, like there was some in one of the scripted series we we're filming, the DOP was saying that there was angles he could get on the car that he couldn't get on the street. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of creative opportunities are aligned, but it's still, you know, it's still in its very early days. Um, you know, that we, unfortunately, um, Dame, I don't know if you find this with your work, but with The Mandalorian and other big uh, blockbusters that are, you know, fly the flag for virtual production, people come in and go, great, it can do all these things. And we're like, yep. that often costs a lot of money. There's still a lot of stuff that needs to get fixed in the post-production process in that scale. Um, but the innovation is moving very, very quickly. And I think the more that we understand the tools, I think the more effective they're going to be. And I, I'm not just saying that not just for editors or, or any of the particular um, uh, technicians we've talked about, it's for everyone to understand. So the art department to understand the difference between virtual dressing and physical dressing, actors to understand the opportunities of having the content playing around them. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's an adjustment that... You know, we we have had a particular method we've been working with in a for a fairly fairly unique while, and so sometimes when tools come in, especially the people that are making the decisions, are uh, become at it with fear. But I, I'm looking forward to us becoming more and more accommodated to it, and it's happening very very quickly. Yeah, okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop you all just there for a moment. I want to bring our other three guests in. So we, we're going to sort of quietly move Dane and Lisa and Gemma into the background. They'll be back again soon uh, while we just bring in Craig Dwyer who's the Vice President for Global Cloud and SaaS Practice at Avid. We've also got David Klafkowski who everybody knows as Claf, who is the founder and CEO of Raccoon and we've got John Laskus who is Creative Director and founder of Black Spot Media Group. So welcome to the three of you. Um, let's just shift the conversation now. Uh, away from being specifically about virtual production um, and talk about sort of content production in general more, more widely um, and particularly and in particular the impact that cloud-based capabilities have had upon um, the editing process and, and content creation. What I want to know is whether you feel that 
that the cloud has in itself um, changed the edit process. And, and John, maybe I can ask you that first of all. I, I mean, I would say absolutely. Um, <clears throat> So we have um, anywhere between 25 and 40 editors working on any given day. And uh, we used to be completely local in New York. Uh, now we're entirely cloud-based and we're entirely remote. Um, and that gives us several benefits. Uh, the first of which is that we can work across time zones so we can work around the clock. Um, but it's also a lot easier for us to be collaborative with the production team. So um, earlier panels were talking about the role of the editor changing and um, when do you get the editor involved? Um, I think the ideal situation really is to have the editor on set and have your DIT working as the media asset manager so that you can make decisions almost immediately on set and you can change the scope and change the direction of your production uh, by having the editor director there. Um, so the editor becomes um, more involved rather than less involved in the process. Um, yeah. Secondly, um, we're also just able to handle far more volume uh, by working in the cloud. Um, it's just a lot easier to get more people involved. It's a lot easier to throw more assistants at a project, uh, to throw more technicians at a project and to get a better result faster uh, by working collaboratively in the cloud. And the thing that shocked me the most about it is how good the current products are for working in, uh, in the cloud. Uh, latency is very low. It's almost exactly like working at a local desktop. Um, so yeah, I would say it's changing how we operate dramatically and almost every day. Claf, would you, would you say that uh, the cloud has delivered on its promise of, of making the editing process more collaborative? I think defining cloud is it's a, it's more important to actually define what that is. Uh, cloud means just something that's sort of available to many people and hosted potentially close to where the internet is. So a cloud provider, remember a cloud provider is literally just a bunch of servers in a data center that's happened to be provided by it tends to people tend to think of the cloud as being something provided by Google or by Microsoft. Uh, it doesn't have to be those you can if something's house, hosted in a well connected data center, uh, it can still be accessed as cloud first. And because of that, if you use a combination of those tools, you end up with something that's infinitely more versatile. So it's about proximity to the various internet hubs that give you the tremendous versatility. And I think, I don't know, blowing raccoons trumpet, but we, we chose to put everything. We still got some hardware and it's more cost effective and it's, it's, it's much less, there's much less latency in a lot of the stuff that we run compared to something running on what would be considered public cloud. To anybody using it, it will feel like the cloud. They log on to it in the same way as with the cloud. But it, it means that we're cloud first so that you can uh, you can access us and then from us reach into other cloud providers because of where we've chosen to host it. It's just more technical than any of our clients would ever want to understand or even comprehend. But I think defining what the cloud is is most important. It's more about the centralization of everything so that everybody, no matter where they are, they can work on it and then they can get together and work collaboratively in a space by not having to move anything. It all stays in the same right. place. And the more content we're creating, remember virtual production, uh, it, it, it is gonna generate more media. You know, there's going to be more rushes. You, I think when we did a pre-chat before this, you know, the best way of reducing the content for a shoot is by taking, giving the director six cans of 16 mil and telling them they haven't got any more. And then, and then the edit is incredibly straightforward because they've shot what they needed or they haven't got it at all. Uh, now with virtual production, you could get into the idea that actually by using volumes, uh, you could actually leave the, sh leave the set with only what you need. I mean, uh, to John's point, you know, put the editor in there, then you've actually got it kind of more or less bar the trimming of a few frames. There's not an enormous volume of rush, which, uh, which there is a lot of rushes created now. And I think, uh, that centralization process just makes it easier and more collaborative. I don't, and back to your original point, it's just defining what the cloud is. It has changed everything. The pandemic made everybody take notice of it. It was happening beforehand, but all it did was it made everyone go, gosh, that's convenient. Now there will be a drift back to, because we all want to be with each other. We all want to see each other, we want to do it. But what it's done is it's made us all go, 
oh my word, that is so much more straightforward. I don't have to waste all that time commuting. And look how creative it can be. And we can do this. I don't know how many people have signed on to this conference, but probably more than would have turned up to a room in Toho. And that just that just adds to it. It's actually such a great addition to our tools. It's not, and it's not actually new. It's just made us open our eyes to it. So Craig, is what we're seeing, um, you know, over the decades, simply just a progressive increase in the volume of content that uh, productions need to work with or feel they need to work with, and then the speed at which they want to be able to work on them. Is that, in essence, is that the journey that's taking place? So, I mean, that's one that's one of the journeys, Mark, I, I think. I mean, if you think about uh, to some of the comments from the, the previous uh, panellists, you know, I, I think the scale of production, the high quality production, the sort of box set release and throw in 27 languages simultaneously, you, you suddenly have this sort of explosion of, of kind of deliverables um, uh, uh, that, that we've never really seen before, right? So in the last sort of 10 years, that's really dramatically changed. So I think there's the sort of industrialization of those processes and the bigger, the, the bigger uh, content producers, right? So the streamers are now really working through how to kind of operate that at scale as a, you know, I, I won't say factory, but they are really ramping this up and, and are talking about creating tens and hundreds of, uh, you know, shows a year. I mean, this is at an unprecedented scale uh, with, with tremendous speed. I, I think when, you, when we think about editorial, you know, I think, uh, and to Claff's point, the, cl the cloud is an enabling technology, you know, obviously, you know, it's one of these overused terms. I think the clients we're working with are benefiting from it in different scenarios, sometimes for augmented or burst capacity, other time for storage and archiving. Uh, so it plays a different, a different role, but I think um, probably the most interesting factor for me in the, in sort of editor, in the, in any ed editorial topic is, is the, this kind of hybrid model that I think we're going to find ourselves in where people still want to have the face-to-face, -face, you know, part of the production creative conversations uh, but also benefit from all of the, you know, focus work and deep work that they can now do remotely or from anywhere they want. And, and that's, I think, trying to work out what the new model looks like is interesting, you know, where there's still maybe once a week all in the office together or twice a week, you know, still doing screening, still reviewing and collaborating, but then, but then sort of not having to necessarily, you know, be forced to tr physically travel to the media, as Claff was saying, you know, they can just virtually travel to the media um, and, and that is really fascinating but I think we're missing some tools here to make that seamless and um, yeah and I think the virtual production stuff is, is in itself just totally fascinating. And, I, I, I guess it's only a matter of time until we get those tools because that's the way that things always work and yeah. John you know you, you I know that you uh, you make a huge amount of very short form content really fast don't you and even though it's, it's relatively short in its form you'll have a number of editors working on it um at, at the same time um do, do you feel like that actually sort of encapsulates with like this this uncomfortable relationship our our industry has between the sort of inevitable industrialization of our processes that's taking place oh, and yet our, and yet our, our, our need to be creative I don't think we need to be uncomfortable about it. I mean, I, I think, I mean, you're right. We deliver a lot. Our, our deliverables list is about 10,000 spots per month um, of various versions. So it's not unique creative, but of the, uh, the versions that we need to deliver. So uh, we need to be massively collaborative, not only with our clients, but with each other. Um, and I, I sort of disagree, Craig, that the, that the tools aren't there. I think that the tools are there to do this now. Um, and um, there are a number of providers that, that have tools that, that work this way. But um, while it might seem at 10,000 deliverables, we are a factory. I think that as a group of creators, we've actually gotten closer by working remotely. And um, 
because we need to be constantly in contact. So as we're, whereas before our editors would be siloed with a producer um, and not necessarily communicate with the rest of the team, um, currently we speak all the time. Um, so mm -hmm. um, I think that the experience has actually brought us closer. As far as working um, in a room with, with a producer or a director, um, yes, I do think that something is lost in that collaboration, but the tools are good enough that we currently just stream um, the interface of whatever platform we're working on, whether it's Avid or um, Premiere directly to the director or the producer. And so it's, you know, they're looking at the timeline, they're looking at the source record monitors, they're looking at everything as we do it, as if they were sitting behind us. So we've been able to replicate that, I think, um, as well as is possible. Uh, the good news is, um, you know, I used to say that uh, we were more of a restaurant than a post house um, because most of our time was spent doing client services and feeding people. And so currently we don't do that. So that's helpful. <laughs> Couldn't agree more, John. I, I think to, to both of your point, the tools are out there. The tools are out there. The, 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 we've been working uh, to this end for quite some time. I think it's getting them so that they're easily accessible and that productions don't need to reinvent the wheel every time they start. And you do that by centralizing, by having a simple conduit to get to it. Now, a big episodic that's doing, that's making a hundred episodes of something, of course, builds a factory and builds a machine, not a, not a factory, builds a machine that is standardized, that will enable it to do it efficiently across a, across a, uh, across an arc of a production because they'll be working on one director might be working on two shows as as um i think lisa made that point earlier but i think it's really important that for other productions of when a production starts a production might only get 10 might only have 10 episodes to make they shouldn't reinvent the wheel in order to do that so there needs to be one of our one of my reasons for being at the moment is to standardize that centralization of work now it used to be that you went to one facility to try and get that centralized now that's not that easy with distributive working mm -hmm. so you need to think about how i might have a favorite place that i want to go and do the grade a favorite place that i want to do the audio but how do i kind of link all that together really and the way you do that if you've got 10 to make is you go to one place to do it now that might not be where your favorite mixer is or where your favorite colorist is or where your favorite editor likes to work because he likes to work in Wales or she likes to be in Bangalore or wherever it might be. You need a simple, not a simple, you need a standardized approach to access to those tool sets. So you're not going, how are we gonna do that? And our industry is really bad, or it used to be really bad at reinventing that process every time you go, oh, do you remember what we did three years ago? And I, and I, it's our job to try and take the learnings that we've got, that we've had over the last 18 months, last two years, and take all the best bits and go, this is right. Not be, it's not dictating creative process. All you're saying, look, these tools really work. Look, and they're all available here. And I, I just think that that's, that's our job is to try and make that work. So that the, that, so the 10 parter gets the advantage of the hundred episodes of something it gets the advantage of, the, of those tools and the, the knowledge of those tools. And you just go, oh my word, that is clever. You know, your, John, your point about being able to be in an edit environment. I hate the use of the word remote. You're working where you want to work rather than remote. Remote's become a bit of a bad word, a bit of a kind of uh, a COVID word. It's not remote. You're just working where you want to work and you want to work collaboratively. A lot of our editors that have worked with us, they go, if I'm doing something, if I'm in the room with somebody, they can see I'm doing something. When they're sitting just watching a stream of my edit monitor, they don't have no idea what you're doing. They're just, they're just sitting there going, okay, well, I don't know if they're working or not. I just have to keep talking or chatting. I think it's being able to then display your actual work monitor to that person who's sitting yeah. in, in your edit. If they happen to want to sit in the edit with you, then you know, little things like that that we've taken into consideration that just improves that experience of, and it's not yeah. remote, it's just working collaboratively where you happen to want to be to save some time. And when you look at the logistics of uh, how much greener it is to do that, oh, but it's not right for everything and it's not right for all the way through a production, but you should be able to say, right, the next five days, we're just gonna be doing it like this. Or the next three weeks, we've all met, we've all got together, let's go away and let's meet on a Friday virtually. And then when we need to get together, we'll go in and watch it 
collaboratively all in the same room and we can all hate each other or chat and I think when you get to season three or something that just goes away that might change and and, and then you'll just work remotely especially if it's some if it's a if it's a game show you know there's all this content is still valid if it's on it's valid as far as I'm concerned but, but I guess I guess Craig you you always get this you know, in moments of innovation and change so technology always becomes very visible doesn't it it, it becomes becomes very present and it looks mm -hmm. hard and then with time it slips into the background again because it, it 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 becomes easier to use there's always there's always that curve isn't there and i and i guess creatives tend to be quite resistant to the early part of the curve as long as it's all it's all visible yeah i think i, I mean and again so so to your point john I, so while I appreciate like the, the technology does exist, it's not sort of uh, what's the what's the phrase sort of universally available. Like I right. think I think there are people who who are working to solve these uh, problems, but as Claff said, it's not quite yet mainstream for everyone, where you can just sort of jump between you know in and out of projects in a in a very easy way across different providers and different tools. We're not quite there, but we're definitely on on that journey. Um, and I and I think I think Mark, you know, there's there's a lot of muscle memory involved in the creative process. I think where you know people get very familiar with the tools they use. They just, you know, again they live in these tools and in these environments. So it's it's um, it's only natural that that you know just even just changing you know the 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 way they interact. You know that it, it's very clear that you know certain editors for certain things like they 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 can sense. The latency they just can right so but but you know we're solving that by putting um you know allowing them to use data centers that are close enough that they can't right so but there's all these different sort of facets i think um you know and becoming you know people becoming comfortable with it uh that, that we're in this sort of in the midst of but but i mean it's extremely promising this is what's exciting is that i think you know these models are inevitable it's not like you know there's some you know, real challenge ahead of us. It's more about how do we smooth out these workflows? How do we remove the friction? Provide clients the portability for their projects, like Clash saying, like, I want to take it from here to here, or maybe another broadcaster is going to kind of to the, do the next series or the next episode. I want to move it from, from you know, where it is today to, to somewhere else. So I, I, think, I think it's, we're certainly on a path where it becomes much easier to, to leverage these, you know, incredible tools that we all have, like you were saying, with even with things like Zoom, it's just amazing. And 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 part of the joy of this is that you can potentially provision this wide range of tools uh, a lot more quickly. You can you can give an editor access to them. But but John, does that does that mean that also there's an expectation now that the editors can do more than cut pictures or do we expect every editor now to also be a colorist also be a visual effects artist to also be a dubbing mixer well let me back up for one second um because i, I do agree uh, craig that uh change is difficult for most people and especially creatives um mostly i notice if i switch between macs and pcs all the editors complain because the control key doesn't work the same way and they go nuts um but <laughs> I, I do disagree and that and uh, that the tools aren't there or that they're not ready. Um, we've used three different tools uh, to great success for it. Um, most of them are based on Teradigi. Um, most of them go to um, IBM uh, cloud servers. Um, but if you are looking for a realistic cloud-based editing solution right now. Avid has a product called Edit On Demand, which we use extensively. And there is no difference to any of our editors from logging onto their home machine. And as far as latency goes and their ability to sense something wrong with the latency, um, we've, we've worked at 4K linked by AMA and editors have been perfectly fine with it. And that is not a recommended use case for that particular mm -hmm. product, but it actually does work. Um, and so Clef, like, our mixers log on there. We do our coloring through there. Everybody logs into the same place. It's just as if we're all in the same facility all the time. Well, and yeah, Joe, I mean, I, it 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 can be. Uh, there's a there, for, for, there's reason there's reasons for us running our own hardware. Uh, 
cost oh, sure. quite, quite, cost is quite key. Uh, but there's no reason why we only use our own hardware. Will, will we also use the public cloud as well? There's, it's uh, my only my point to that was the cloud is. I was really only referring to the cloud doesn't mean a public provider. The cloud right. can be something that's available in a cloudy way. So it's cloud first. Right. Uh, yeah, and you, you no, can no, take no, I, I, it, Honestly, if you could use some fast access on Azure, it's amazing. It's just not cost effective for a lot of post processes. It depends on what you're doing. You have to be careful. That's what it depends. And it I, depends. I was actually I was, about, <laughs> I was in a panel with a guy who was working on, um, you know, small feature, six million dollar feature, and uh, he was working in the cloud, and he said that his costs were half what it would be for him to rent because he he, he would rent all the systems and yeah. um, and, and put them in a location. So it worked out for him to be cheaper to work um, remotely in the cloud. But yeah, it doesn't need to be. It, does, it certainly shouldn't be public because I mean, obviously, we're all working with MPAA restrictions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but you could you could take something like Teradigit and install that on any storage system that you might have anywhere in the world. Yeah, so I know. I mean, I, I think Teradigit is amazing, and it's the secret sauce to a lot of things. That actually, when you when you make it sing, it's amazing. And the editors don't question it if you get it right. Uh, if they want to question it, and they happen to want to work, they don't they don't want to work in Wales or wherever they happen to be, and they actually want to work in a facility then you, you can put them in a facility and they can still work on Teradici and they suddenly love it. And it's right. exactly <laughs> the same experience. Right. So there's a, and that's not, that's not in any way criticizing an editor. You know, they actually haven't sat with the processor in their room for a really long time. They've been on extenders to a machine room somewhere in the facility. And right. so they, they've, they've been KVMing rather than Teradiciing for, the last 15 years, so it probably probably almost longer. I remember when we first put our first KVMs in, uh, and I said they'll never, it'll never wash, it'll never wash. And then we put all the kit in the machine room. Look, that was a really long time ago. Put all the kit in the machine room, and you know what? Only one of them commented. They said, "Why is it so quiet in here?" Because <laughs> the Z, whatever it was, that had been sitting in the corner of their room, go. <laughs> okay, now, I, want to, I want to bring the others back in in a moment, um, but before I do. Uh, and, and before this conversation gets too technical, yeah, I, sorry. I do want to get you to, to answer this question about, about whether you feel there's an expectation now that an editor can perform more craft processes well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, I think that the expectation is because fewer and fewer people are, are sitting behind an editor or watching what the editor is doing in real time. Um, your first cut needs to be perfect. It needs to be polished. So it needs mm -hmm. to... You, you need to be able to get 90% of the way there as, as the offline editor or what used to be called an offline editor. So yes, you're still gonna finish in the traditional way, um, but an editor needs to be able to write, an editor needs to be able to cut, you have to be able to color, you've gotta be able to mix, uh, and you've gotta be able to have a basic mastery of visual effects. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's non-negotiable. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, I'm going to bring the others uh, back in at that point because I think it's a really good point to um, to talk about sort of you know, all forms of production again. Um, there's Dane, who's uh, further along his journey. I hope um, he probably started, Tried, got petrol while we were uh, off on the other bit of the conversation. And Lisa, and, and there's there's Gemma back with us. Um, so I, I want to bring you guys in on on this question um, about about whether there's now, whether there's anything such thing anymore as a rough cut. Is, is there now an expectation because we can do so much more, so much earlier in the process that, that a cut has to look amazing from the first time it gets reviewed? Gemma? In my experience, okay. so on, on, sorry, sorry, tramp over here. Um, in my experience on the productions we're working on, absolutely, and I agree with everything that I just heard about um, an editor having to understand all of the pieces of the supply chain. But I also saw a lot of that in the more traditional post-production processes. The, the editors that were, were brought in to shape the film very much understood sound, music, uh, visual effects, color. They were quite often, they had the director's ear and, and would influence those decisions. The other, the two points that I really wanna make though are we're in a bit of an anomaly right now because there aren't enough people. And this process um, 
hasn't matured enough. And it was really obvious to me yesterday where we're starting a large production with a traditional studio and the VFX supervisor just came off of an LED show that I've heard about, but had no sort of inroads to it. I didn't know anyone that worked on it. And speaking with him, you know, we, we spoke for hours because the methodology that he used was completely different than what we do and successful. And there are reasons for that, but a lot of it these days is driven by manpower. Who do we have available? And so that, that's starting to shape some of the decisions that we make. The other point that I wanna make is the first shift for us was um, you know, with what I call a uh, distributed workforce. I don't like the word uh, remote either. It does sound like you sort of diluting the process <laughs> or distributed. And if you're distributed, you don't have that, you know, a supervisor walks into a pod of eight artists spinning up ideas. The director's coming in at two and we wanna present five or six different ideas for a tricky shot. That's all gone. You're not, there's no pod. The director is with you constantly and, and you need to find a way to communicate with your team and nimbly and agilely present those ideas. So there was a six to eight month adjustment period when COVID first hit and we were uh, you know, being sent to remote locations to work. But the other advantage that happened is I can tap into resources and don't have to wait for someone to get on a jet or finish up what they're working on. I can book time with people for a day or two that I wouldn't previously have access to. So there, there were some you know, adjustments in the beginning and I feel like we're still in this um, learning stage. I don't think it's fully set yet. And it was very clear to me yesterday. I'd love to hear what the others think. Mark, just about your, your, your point about whether there's such a thing as an offline anymore, you know, a, ru a rough cut. I just, I, a lot of that depends on the production, but there are a lot of people viewing yeah. what, we're, what we're beginning to do rough cuts. Yeah. And there's a lot of, I'm not going to use the word, I, I'll say it, inexperienced people viewing a cut where the notes might come back and say, I couldn't hear that properly, that dialogue properly, or I didn't like the colour of the background, or all those sort of things, that they are just distracting to actually the narrative. If it is truly a rough cut, I think there needs to be that description as to what it is they're viewing and what they're viewing it for. Now, um, I think Gemma probably has to deal with this so much more than anybody else. You know, putting, as a post supervisor, you put your execs in front of something and say, you are watching this for this reason. And I, yeah, sorry, Gemma. No, 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 jump in. I'm just going to jump in. I think that, you know, we as the post supervisor is the neck that turns the head. You know, we are the one who needs to, to focus their gaze on exactly what they need to, to pay attention to. To go back to your original question, um, you know, the idea of, um, you know, an offline, well, sorry, you know, to go back to some of the other points, um, I think that, you know, when we are showing, it depends on what point we are in. I mean, I come from this purely from a high-end television, um, episodic uh, film background. And when we're showing our assemblies to um, the, you know, the rough cut, the, the rough assembly, you know, that we would produce on a weekly basis for, for either a film or a TV show. Um, it could be a weekly, it could be a daily basis, depending on kind of what the, uh, what the project is. We, have, we show that to a very, very tiny group of people because we don't need everybody weighing in saying, you know, that that sounds awful. This is, you know, you know, this is not good. The grade, you know, the, the grade's not right there. And so we really do kind of make sure that that group of people is very handpicked right at the very start. Further down the line, once you've got to the end of your shoot and you've got a full assembly or an editor's cut, and, you know, I, I spoke to um, a uh, an assistant editor who is very uh, well known in the industry. He works with some very, very big um, uh, editors on absolutely massive projects, $100 million projects. And he said that, you know, it really is the editor's cut now. It's not the rough assembly because we're no longer presenting a rough cut. This is not rough. We have had time to, um, to refine it already by even by the end of the shoot. So even by the end of the shoot, I mean, that is yeah. phenomenal. 
Yeah, absolutely. But but if you think about the way that it used to come in and it used to be developed in, in the lab, you know, your film would come in, you'd be cutting, you're actually cutting your film and you are roughly assembling it. It's not, there's nothing like that kind of work that needs to go into it now. It's very much, it's very much quicker, which gives the editor a whole lot more time to, to do that, you know, early... Uh, refining of the cut before the before anybody really gets to see it and then we're into our fine cut and our director um time and even that period there is very closed it's you know it's not shown to the you know a lot of the producers it's shown to very key individual people we get quite far down the process of refining the curtain you know different you know named cuts you know kind of version you know, however many versions you get to um, before we end up showing people that, you know, you know, will also absolutely need to have their their opinion taken into into account. But we're much further down the process than. Yeah, you guess you're 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 removing the ability for them to make too many dramatic decisions. Because I mean, on a on a proper production, uh, they've employed professionals to do something to a certain point, and uh, why would they have an opinion about the sound or the uh, on a on a high-end production. There's a lot of other television out there where commissioners will have input yes. at a point you just couldn't believe. You know, this is television, different types of television. And I think that uh, that's where you have to be careful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, careful. yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, Kurt Mason making a point again about the fact that actually for, we talk about bigger, bigger budgets in, um, uh, in episodic, but meanwhile, across sort of TV in general, most people's experience, Will be that budgets are getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and you know it brings a different kind of pressure. Um, but Eric Peters has just raised, I, oh, I think, is actually the the, kind of the 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 heart of this conversation from a, a creative point of view, which is that you know when I when I hear you, Gemma, describing that process, certainly on on higher end content, um, one bit of me thinks, oh, that must be amazing because you know so much has been done. Um, by the time the shoot ends, then this is fantastic. You know, the editors are going to really focus on fine tuning that story. But you know, as as, as Eric is is asking, does it also mean? And Lisa, I want to just put this to you if I can. Does it also mean that some serendipity gets lost? Does it mean that actually I we lose some of the magic of the cutting room because so much has already been put in stone before we ever get there? But you don't, I mean, the, the magic that we're talking about, you know, that, you, yes, okay, there's, you know, absolutely, we have um, hopefully blocked and we have, you know, kind of carefully storyboarded, carefully understood what we we're going to shoot on something like a virtual production stage in a volume. Um, and so, yes, you have your your clear shots as to kind of, this is the shot for this and this is the shot for that. But you still have the magic of the performance. That's the whole you know, point of it, you know, you get, once you've got that magic of the performance, it's, it's down to the editor to, to pull something out of that, those takes and cut it together to make it look beautiful and look it, make, make it look incredible. I, to some of the other points that we were raised earlier, I love the, you know, kind of, I'm seeing more and more editors asking to work remotely, oh, sorry, kind of, Kind of distributed. We were distributed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, during the shoot, because they don't have the director with them, they don't have the the you know kind of. They're often not working anywhere near set. They're working perhaps in a cutting room um, environment, um, and they can do that work from home. However, more and more we're finding that those people are yes, they're working remotely through the shoot but then they're coming back in the fine cut to sit down next to the director um, and to work with them. And there is that bit of magic, again, you know, going the idea of the magic, you know, there is that fantastic creative spark that happens between intensely creative people when they get together and they bounce ideas off each other. And it's beautiful. It's you create something better than you might have otherwise created, especially for the level of project that we're on it because they're right. not fast to right. But But I, I but I, 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 I do want to ask Lisa about this because to that point, when you bring creative people together, magic happens. When you bring them together in person, magic happens. If, if there's so much of that happening at the front of a production now, um, do we actually 
do we change the balance of where the creative decisions get made in a way that's quite profound? I don't think so. I don't either. No, I don't, 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 don't think so. So, Mark, can I just jump in? Because I, I think yeah, some of on. this is really also quite genre specific, right? So, because I, yeah. I think that there are certain program formats that are really made in the edit. I mean, they're, 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 maybe they're library or archive based documentaries. You know, they're, they're, some of those, you know, um, in my experience, that there's just a, to, to, I think it was um, the previous question, there's a lot that the editor and the production team do, kind of telling a story, creating a story and sort of finding angles. And that's, you know, some of the best, you know, some of the most interesting work I ever did was that style of editorial, where you were really given a huge amount of freedom to work with the production team to tell the story you could from archive and, and, and from interviews. Um, but I think when you're, again, when we're talking about these productions where there's a, a huge amount of prep and pre-visualization, and, you know, I, th I, I think it's a, it's a different type of editorial um, that, than, than the sort of more free form uh, kind of when you're just kind of cr almost creating the story in the edit. I think sure, but you're, not, you're not losing any of the serendipity if you're doing a lot of pre-visualization -vis or, uh, you know, if you're working on an LED shoot. I mean, it's no different. I mean, would we say that we didn't have serendipity when we were cutting on film on a Steam Deck? Um, because everything was locked in place and we couldn't change anything. You know, all we could do is mm -hmm. tape film together. Um, you know, nobody said, oh, there's no magic in, in this. Um, well, it was only 24 enough. frames of magic a second. That was all the Right. <laughs> there, still, there still is only 24 frames a second, you know, or right. 24 plus frames a second. So there's not actually that many decisions. So there is an enormous amount of magic that can actually happen if you think about timing of a cut is just astounding. And that is in is the same process now as it was mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the in the 1910s, you know, so you know, although they may have only had 18 frames a second to choose from then, but it's it's still it's still an astounding. It can be it can tell a, a tremendous story. Taking two frames off a scene off a shot can change it completely, and you could you only get it when you watch it, and that's probably where the magic happens. They can be pondering over something in an edit for a really long time, and then somebody just goes, well, maybe if we just do this. And then suddenly it works. Yeah. And you think there's actually, if you talk about computer science, there's actually a tiny, there's actually not very many variables at that point. You know, no. you've got to, you're not working with that many variables. And you could actually try every single one of them if you really wanted to, because there's actually not that many to choose from. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah, in yeah. a second, two second window where you're thinking about a cut. And if you just, if you nail it, it's amazing. And it can make yeah. a scene sing. And that's the magic from an edit that you might not get that when you're on your own working virtually, not remotely. You might not get that moment where you're together, and you look at each other and say, gosh, that's just, you know, that makes me cry. That makes me laugh. That makes me... That's the beauty of but that is the beauty of post. I want to, I want to bring Lisa back because she's managed to, to reconnect, I think. Go on, Lisa. I hope so. I hope so. Um, but I just I don't think it's any coincidence. Or maybe not. That we have have a lot of our around. Oh, yeah. And uh, but yeah. No. I and we're... I think because technology you can't hear me. I'm afraid, sorry, not no, Lisa, we're not gonna be able to get two frames of magic from you at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my technology works. <laughs> Can I jump in and just uh, yeah. to, um, uh, Clav's point? Um, I, I, I have definitely worked with, um, I've worked with a number of different fantastic people along my career, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but I do remember speaking in two separate conversations to two different Oscar and BAFTA winning editors. Um, and both of them said that they refused to learn the shortcuts on, on their, um, their editing machines because they felt that the time that it took them to think about the cut before making the cut was just as important as making the cut. Um, and that the undo button actually didn't help them very much. You know, it was, I can try a million different permutations of this, but actually what I need to do is think about it and it's, it's the same, you know, it's that measure twice, cut once, you know, it's, a, you know, the same thing. So, um, I, yeah, I could definitely agree with that. Although that just remind me of, um, of one of the strongest arguments that was used against Avid when it was first invented, which was that the, the time it took for a reel of film to, 
to rewind on the, on the steam boat was actually the time you needed to really think about how you were going to make your next edit. Um, and sometimes those kind of purist arguments are really just an elegant form of change resistance, aren't they? I think I think that there is there is definitely. I mean, we're getting fantastic content from the virtual production. We're getting you know amazing uh, collaborative tools that we have in terms of you know working um, in all different places that we we want to work from. Um, but I think actually the you know coming back to the editing, you know, there is a craft of editing. There's an art to editing. There is a you know there is um, uh, and I, I think that it's something that is I don't think it changes huge amount I think it, it's storytelling at its core so um, yeah. but I, I think Lisa you might need to, to drop off in a second if I remember rightly because you have a call I think at, at uh, 5 45 but um well our time UK time um so I do unfortunately if you suddenly go that's why you've gone so people don't think it's simply that your your connection's broken <laughs> um but uh but D Dane actually I, I wanted to to ask you something there from from uh, what Gemma's just said. Um, you know, could, could could you see the use of uh, previous technology sort of becoming so sophisticated that actually people, in effect, are starting to to kind of edit in Unreal Engine? That actually, you, you know, you you kind of extend what is happening in in a virtual production studio even further than. It currently goes. I mean, those tools are available and being used now. I, I want to go back to the comment about serendipity, sort of restricting creative. This is um, a bias that we fight constantly in previous before virtual production. There's this idea that um, if you're a director and you've, you've been put in charge of a large franchise and you're being introduced to my company. There is a there's an idea that we are going to have creative control. We are going to make the film and we're taking that power away from someone. And what virtual production has done uh, almost more effectively than any other technology is fight that prejudice. There's a, a film that we worked on. This is just before virtual production became, you know, sort of ubiquitous. And we put the director in a headset and the director was physically resisting putting on a vibe and looking at what was his plates and animated characters. And over a very short period of time, he fell in love with the idea that he could play. He didn't have 20 people around him second guessing. He's just downstairs on his volume with an editor creating the film. And that's the blueprint. The final film didn't look anything like it because the magic happened later. But we set the fundamentals down. So there's almost this straight path to delivery and then if you deviate, as you should, you know, you should always look for those serendipitous moments, but separate the art from the technology. A computer is just removing repetitive tasks from the workflow so that the artist can create something meaningful. And if we look at it that way, um, virtual production has really ushered that in. And I, I really enjoy the fact that people are embracing visualization as the first step a lot more than they were previously. And I also think that um, we're starting to see the impact on story and, and, and the end result. I see it all, all the time when I see the finished cut. All an improvement. And, and I think it starts with this uh, fighting this bias that somehow the creative control is being handed over to, you know, the computer people, the technologists. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great point. And, uh, you know, I, I feel with this topic, one's currently in that a sort of tension between feeling that actually what technology is doing at the moment is to, in fact, um, enable more kind of purity in the creative process and to actually enable um, the director in particular to, to realise his or her vision more, more truthfully um, and to have less compromise. On the one hand, and then the next moment you get pulled towards feeling, yeah, but the sheer amount of technology, the complexity, where it is in its evolution and the fact that that none of it is yet, you know, it, is, is, is completely smoothed out, um, actually means that we're getting some interference, we're getting some, we're getting some noise in the creative process. And I guess, depending on, on what you've just worked on, 
what genre you're in, where you happen to be sitting. As a creative person, you might experience either of those things. We definitely talk a lot in in uh, you know in what we do about you know um, facilitating the creative vision, and I think that you're absolutely right. I think that there is um, you know kind of the fantastic thing about all this technology is that we are facilitating the creative vision. You know, kind of we are enabling it to work even when there's a pandemic going on, even when there's you know uh, you know things hitting us left, right, and centre. Even though your production is you know um, working from all the <laughs> from home or from from wherever, um, you're able to transport people on set, and we're still able to capture the the fantastic performances from the actors. Um, putting them in places that they would never have been, you know, that, that it would be an impossible thing shot to get otherwise. So I think it is all about create, facilitating the creative vision, but allowing the technology to help us with that. Mark, you, you make the point about the technology of being smoothed out. Um, go back to labs, the technology of chemicals in a bath processing film was never smoothed out no, it was true. always a little bit woo, and uh, <laughs> it was incredibly complex but it was chemically complicated rather than electronically complicated uh you know an old a linear a linear a linear two inch edit suite or a one inch edit suite was incredibly complicated and very expensive uh it, we've now got some astoundingly wonderful technologies that actually it makes it, it makes the the you know chemical bath look you know, archaic, but in fact, it's telling. It's, it's allowing the same process. It's just it's just giving much more choice to everybody as they work as they as they're working. And I, I, technology should be enabler. And to to Gemma's point, technology is an enabler, not it is a means to an end. There's a technology that doesn't have any point. It just gets in the way. And I think uh, you know a nonlinear edit system should be designed to be easy to use. Uh, working uh, working virtually should be easy to use so that the creativity works and I think there'll always be bumps because there'll always be a new innovation and I, I, yeah. I, I, I think it's such an exciting time lots to do with how much money is being spent but also because we're all kind of engaging with just some really interesting ways of working. Mm. Well, I'm really intrigued to know because both, both Craig and John you, you, you spent, both spent a decent chunk of your careers being editors. Um, true. I, I'm really keen to know from both of you how you would be feeling if you were starting out right now? <laughs> how would I be feeling? I'd, I'd have more hair. I'd, that would be nice. So, uh, yeah. like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, the, you? Um, you know, I had the great fortune of working with some great production teams and directors. And, and I, I, think, I think if you're starting a career, I mean, you and I have talked a little bit about this, Mark, as well. I, I, I do think that actually, while we've evolved to these models, the, the, the sort of initiation and camaraderie you build in production is, is very hard if, if you're, you know, if you don't get the opportunity to kind of be around those people and, you know, have mentors. I, I was, you know, so lucky to work with so many talented people who, you know, took me on a journey, um, you know, and I, of course I was actively participating, but they, they sort of, uh, you know, spent a lot of time with me and I, and I learned a huge amount very quickly. So I think, but I think it's very exciting that the sort of um, the types of projects one could now participate in, right? And actually what Gemma was saying about the sort of this, this spectrum of high-end television, feature, promo, that sort of, you know, mm -hmm. music, you know, that world is, is, you know, extremely exciting. And you've seen, you know, a lot of people are crossing these genres, not just editors, but directors and um, artists and it's really an exciting um, time for, from that perspective. Yeah, yeah, and, and I guess you could say, Craig, that because of that, there's there's far greater likelihood that you're going to find the type of content to which you're reason really well suited as an editor and the thing that you love because there's there's so much more diversity of content. Yeah, to work on. yeah, so many different stories being told. I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John, what would you feel if you were starting your career now? Um, I, I, I agree with Craig. I, I, I think that the biggest challenge that that we face, or, or if if you're if you're running a post facility um, that we face, is uh, 
developing the talent and the contacts uh, for the young editors coming in or the assistant right. editors coming in. Because as Craig said, you don't get that experience of um, interacting with your peers on a daily basis and learning from your peers on a daily basis. And you're not meeting the producers, you're not meeting the directors, you're not meeting the, um, you know, the, the people farther up the food chain. So um, developing those relationships, I think is much harder now than it, than it used to be. I mean, something that we think about a lot because, um, you know, as we try to develop people's careers, uh, we want to make it as easy as possible. But on the other hand, um, almost everybody you know knows how to edit now. I mean, my son is 10 and he's got a YouTube channel and he's making fantastic yeah. clips. So everybody comes in with basic knowledge that it used to take us, you know, when working in film or working uh, rough cutting on, uh, on three quarter inch decks. You know, it used to take us years to, to learn. Um, they've already got the basic instincts. They've already got the storytelling ability done because they do it every day. Um, they live in much more of a video-based world than we ever did. So um, it's a lot easier to get people technically proficient. So there are more opportunities there, but the networking is something that I'm still not entirely sure how, how we're going to solve that. Um, mostly we just try to make sure that all of the junior staff um, spend at least two or three hours together on Zoom every day uh, discussing what they're doing because otherwise um, they'll never meet each other. They don't live in different states, they live in different countries um, and they'll never get um, that experience that you did get working in a large environment. John, it's interesting you make that point because back when I ran old fashioned facilities, uh, we had the same problem even then because in fact, anybody being an assistant or a tape op or a data op wasn't anywhere near the edit suite. The idea and the idea of the assistant sitting in the suite when they were either making tea, loading film, or putting tapes in decks, or moving cassettes around, you know, depending on when you when you started, yeah. you were actually there with the editor learning from him or her and actually learning the craft of how to manage a client, how to deal with this situation. And it, it, it was and that disappeared a long time ago. So Finding that, luckily, that as you very you're to your point completely, the skill the skill of editing or the skill the technical proficiency of editing is much more straightforward. The tools are there, designed to be easy to use, and that understanding that the narratives uh, they all get. But how to sell your edit into a client is a completely different. I mean, that is you're either born with it or you have to learn it or you're just a black, you, that, that's really hard, that creativity. I mean, I, I edited for a while and I couldn't stand the criticism, I hated it. Just, it was, I really couldn't, I thought that's the best I can do. I can't do anything else. And I just, I, I, you have to be pretty thick skinned, I think. But how we train that next generation is so important. And we, we, we are really focused on that, I'm sure you are, as to just trying to find that, that way of getting them to work collaboratively and get them in so that, they actually spend some time and they're not all just in isolation somewhere. It's, 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 it's going to be a challenge for us. And it already is a challenge. There aren't enough good people because of the fantastic volume of work that needs to be made, which is great. It's a very exciting time. We definitely have a, a real problem in our cutting rooms at the moment of, you know, we have people who can do the job who technically, as you said, you know, can, they're technically able, they know what they're doing, but it's the etiquette and hierarchy that they struggle with understand that there is hierarchy to our cutting rooms that you know there is process to who you raise a problem to who you escalate a problem to and um, what is a problem what isn't a problem you know kind of there is you know there's a lot of that part of it that people just are unable to and to learn because they're not able to sit next to the first assistant yeah. or you yeah. know so our trainees are you know, we're, we're trying, and that's one reason why there's a lot of cutting rooms that are now coming back together is because, um, you know, especially for those younger people, it's good to have the first assistant there and the second assistant and then the trainee, uh, you know, kind of, they're all sitting, I mean, they can't all sit together in the same room at the moment, but, but they can at least kind of be in rooms next to each other and, or we can have a room big enough that we can put a couple of people in it. But it's yeah. really, it's yeah. a really interesting challenge that we have at the moment. Yeah, for, all that we, for all that we're talking about, you know, the capability now to work remotely, and Dane, I want to just ask you about this. Um, you know, we, we, we can work remotely, but meanwhile, one of the things that virtual production is doing is it's, it's kind of recreating the studio, you know, in the old sense of the word, of, of the studio environment. And, and I do wonder whether people will start to feel so much benefit from having 
um, creative people together in one location that we could actually find a bit of a move back towards, you know, the cutting room, which is at the studio, which is just down the corridor. What do you think, Dave? Well, it's it's been a constant uh, source of contention in our studio and with my clients because initially, 700 plus days ago, we thought this was going to be temporary. And now there are people that believe we will always work the way that we are now and others that believe, you know, the, the collaboration is key. But just going back to what someone was just saying about selling their cut and uh, being in the same physical presence with someone, what's missing on this call and on any Zoom call or video chat is body language. There's a slight delay in the feed. There, there's a completely different way that we have to relate to one another. And there isn't that intimacy. And as someone that my primary focus is gathering information, evaluating projects and convincing people to either do something or not do something, um, I had to relearn that skill set. It's taken a tremendous toll on some of the uh, most important creatives in our company because the relationship uh, with the client is now completely digital. So again, I think it's another area that we need to solve, uh, but that we're just in the early days of, and it's compounded by the fact, as uh, Gemma brought up and, and others, that there just aren't enough people to service the demand for content right now. So we're sort of uh, making do with what we have. Uh, but, but I don't think the, you know, the die is cast yet where all of this will end up. I think some form of distributed and, uh, you know, virtual work will continue. I think it's going to need to. And I think there are tremendous advantages. But I do enjoy having a small cadre of people in the same room. And, I, and we still do that when it's yeah. essential. And there are huge I benefits. Think the, I think the, the point is, it, it doesn't matter where your data or your hardware is. That, that room can be anywhere now as long as it's connected to the internet. So you're not dictated to by where your racks are, which used to be the case. And that's definitely not the case now. Uh, it doesn't right. have to be, but if you centralize, you're then, if you centralize and then work in a distributed fashion, you can then choose to bring everyone together into one place uh, at any point during your production. And that's the most important thing to know that, to know that you're not stuck in a, uh, it's a virtualized, not virtualized production, but you're not stuck. You're not stuck distributed. You can actually come together and work collaboratively. And if you get it right at the beginning, it's really easy to do. Um, and that's a great point, Claff. And, and we must end in a moment. So, Craig, I want to give you the last word on this. Uh, I mean, do, do you think that there's inevit an inevitability that eventually we will work this balance out? Um, because one thing's for sure, which is that creative, creativity never diminishes. The quality of content only ever goes up. And, and we will find the best way to bring all these capabilities together in order to deliver it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you, you know, as illustrated through the conversation today, we're, we're, we're on a, we're, we're really, there's some velocity around this new way of working and real momentum and, and it's real. You know, so so so. Um, but I, but I th and I think it's going to get enhanced, right, and enriched with with additional layers of uh, you, you know quality tooling um, to to make this even more frictionless. Um, so I think it's yes. I, I mean, it's it's clearly inevitable. And I'm not. I, I don't even mean just working. You know, cloud. I mean just decentralized working or distributed working. There's just such a huge range of benefits that I think uh, and lots of incredibly smart people in the community trying to work through how to optimize it so I think it's going to be so it's a very exciting time but I, I suspect like Claff says we will we will eventually come to work out the best way of making use of of the physical um in all that well look thank you all so much it's been great to talk to you well done Dane for staying with us uh, I hope you're nearly there and I hope you can put the fire out successfully um, thank you for joining us, Dane and Gemma and John and Claff and Craig, and also, of course, to Lisa, who just had to, to go uh, a few moments ago. So that's all from us now. Uh, this has been an open event, which has been open to, to people who aren't members of the DPP, as well as those who are. But actually, most of our conversations happen in a member-only environment, and we have a lot of really good ones. So uh, I'm going to have to just end by saying, 
But if you don't know what it means uh, to be a DPP member and, and the kind of benefits you'll get, then do please take a look at our website and find out because you might find that this is something that your company would really benefit from. I do hope so. Uh, but for now, thanks so much for being with us and good day, good evening or good night, depending on where you are. Bye for now.